the Numinous Podcast with Carmen Spaniola. Hi there, and welcome to the Numinous Podcast, where we have interesting conversations with everyday folks about the mystery of life. I'm your host, Carmen Spaniola, joining you from the lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Songhees and the Squamalt First Nations, commonly known as Victoria, BC, Canada. And my friends, it's a huge day on the Numinous Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with British Columbia record breaking pumpkin grower Dave Chan. Dave has grown the heaviest pumpkin in BC's history at 1,911 pounds. Dave's been growing for many years and finally achieved his dream in 2021. I am thrilled to have him on the show today to share all his secrets and stay tuned for a rubination at the end and a recap of all the links to find pictures and details of Dave's big win. Well, welcome, Dave. I'm so glad that you have taken time to share with us all that you know about pumpkins and we can celebrate with you your great pumpkin victory with the BC record. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I've been growing pumpkins for 12 years now, uh, seriously, but uh, yeah, my first pumpkin was actually uh, 40 years ago. Wow, okay, so, well, great. You're starting this right off. Give, give us a sense. I really wanna know like what your um, history with growing is like, do you come from, are you a farmer? Do you come from a long line of growers? Like take us back 40 years ago, then what, how have you become such a great grower? What's your history there? Well, apparently my ancestors were farmers in Southern China, but no, I became a dentist. I've uh, been uh, retired for 11 years and, uh, uh, the story 40 years ago, I was watching Johnny Carson. Uh, which is probably predates you. Oh, I remember Johnny Carson. I totally remember Johnny Carson. Yes. And he played the great. Anyway, go ahead. Yes. He was interviewing the world champion pumpkin grower. And it caught my attention. <clears throat> At that time, the, 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 the world record was 535 pounds. Today, oh. it was broken a week ago. Uh, it's 2,702 pounds. Um, so anyhow, he asked, he asked this fella, where did you get your seeds from? And he said, the, uh, the, the, the world champion is a Canadian up in Nova Scotia and his name is Howard Dill. So I remember that name and, uh, uh there was no internet or anything like that. So I, I just got a, a, an envelope out and I wrote Howard Dill, Nova Scotia. And uh, he was pretty well known there. And within a week, I got a reply and, <laughs> and four seeds. Wow. So, yeah, my son was four years old at the time. And uh, so we thought, well, we'll try this and grow him a pumpkin for Halloween. And uh, to make a long story short, it, it, it turned out to be a 278-pound pumpkin. Wow. Which is bigger than regular big pumpkins around. And uh, half the weight of the world record <laughs> was so I was quite pleased with that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then 14 years ago, we moved to Richmond, uh, had, a, had a quite a large plot of land. And I knew exactly from the day we bought it where I was going to grow <laughs> pumpkins. So... Yeah, it started it. I sort of remembered having fun with it. And I thought I was going to do that when I retired. Wow, that is amazing. And so now you're pretty hardcore. I've read that you actually even attend pumpkin grower conferences. So when did this go from just a, an interest watching Johnny Carson and, and, you know, writing to your, to this mythic man, Howard Dill and getting your seeds, when did it go from that to like, okay, I'm buying a ticket and going to this conference? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, it was right, right from the get go. I was the, the, the first day we, we walked through the house and uh and and saw the backyard uh, i i told people probably my wife first uh that this is where i was going to grow pumpkins so i knew right from the you know 14 
uh, years ago where I was going to do it and how I was going to do it. But you got to know, you need a thousand square feet per pumpkin plant, which is bigger than most people's front yard right now. Yeah. And um, and so uh, there, there there was enough room to grow the pumpkin, and and I just said, okay, this is what I'm going to do, and. It, that was two years before retirement and I have a lot of hobbies. And, and so I thought, okay, we'll go for this seriously. Wow. So, okay. I'm, I'm going to ask you a series of questions to get really into the brass tacks because uh, I, I have my sights set on one day also growing <laughs> a great pumpkin, but I would like to ask you why giant pumpkins, like what about giant pumpkins ignites your passion? Well, I always had a garden, always <laughs> grew tomatoes and beans and peas and potatoes. And um, just seeing how fast and how big they got is uh, nobody has left my backyard without a big <laughs> smile on their face. And um, knocks 50 years off old people's age when they come into my backyard. And so it is a tremendous amount of fun. Oh. Let me give you a couple of statistics on this particular pumpkin. Yes, please. It, from the time we pollinated uh, the pumpkin uh, it, and to the harvesting and the way off was 98 days. That's so in it? 98 days, which is roughly three months, Yeah. it grew 1,911 pounds. So the... <laughs> Uh, we, we measure these, we measure these pumpkins and have a formula. We put it on a standard graph that somebody has made up and we can estimate the growth of these pumpkins. And, and coming from a science background this year, because of COVID, I decided to really document this particular pumpkin on a spreadsheet so i know exactly what i did to it every day of its growth wow. and most people are not as oc as i am and they would probably measure it once a week or uh, whatever and uh, but uh, my wife and i we measured it every day so we could correlate it with the the fertilizers we gave it and how much water etc and um uh, the, the biggest one day gain that we had was 71 pounds, 71 what? pounds. That's like every minute you're looking at it, you're seeing it put on grams and grams. Wow. You, can almost, you, you almost can see it grow. Whoa. And exactly. so, so we measured it three times because as you know, a, a pumpkin is a bit lumpy and bumpy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just can measure a, in a dip or in a high spot and it's not quite accurate. Well, it's not supposed to be accurate. The way they actually uh, judge the winner or loser is weighing it. It's not how big the pumpkin is, it's the weight. Mm. So this is just a guesstimate, but like I said, we measured it three times because we couldn't believe. <laughs> you know, quite often you'll get 50 pounds a day wow. and you can run that for two weeks. So. Um, you know, 50 pounds for 14 days of 700 pounds. That is possible, quite possible. Or some of these really bigger than mine, they could run 60 pounds a day for a couple of weeks. And that's right at that peak growth time. Okay. Well, my peak was that 71 pound day. Wow. And uh, because we, we measured it every day, uh, the next day, we measured it three times again, and it was bigger again. So we knew we didn't make a mistake because, like I wow. said, we documented this one. And um, so we probably put on another 30 or 40 pounds the next day. That and is amazing. When you think about a two-day, well, I know it was a two-day uh, total of 100 pounds. <laughs> well, that's sort of like 6% of the whole weight of the pumpkin. Yeah, yeah, that's like right before your eyes. Wow. Yes, yeah. Wow. And so the one that you grew, the seeds for this, are, are these also a Howard Dill 
Is that also known as Atlantic Giant or are those two different varieties? Howard Dill uh, did a lot of experimentation himself. And um, uh, I'm not sure if he created that name or somebody else gave it to him. But if I'm not wrong, he actually patented his seed because it was a cross between uh, probably uh, just a regular field pumpkin and whatever he could grow. Mm. And so uh, uh, all the pumpkins for all the, the whole world and all the way offs are just generally named Atlantic Giants. Okay. And so that's what you grew? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, that's what I have outside right now. And it's only 116 pounds, but uh, now I feel right. like pretty, I've, I've, I feel inadequate, but I, I want to know exactly the details here. So when are, is it, it can't be direct. So is it, is it transplant? Are you planting inside? When do you do that? Yes. Uh, we, we, uh, these seeds are about an inch long. The, the coating of the seed is, is not like your regular pumpkin seed. If, if you bit into it, you'd probably break your teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to file the edges to uh, make the seed coat thinner, and you'd soak it in some water for about six hours. Okay. And that would soften it a little bit. And the way a lot of pumpkin growers do it, they'll take uh, two or three paper towels, soak it in water, uh, fold it into maybe four or eight, uh, and, and in the middle there, you would insert your pumpkin seeds, place it in a Ziploc bag. And uh, in my case, uh, we have a, a heated bathroom floor. So I just put it on the bathroom floor. Other people will put it on top of their hot water tank. And, and again, other people would make germination boxes with a light bulb in it, mm -hmm. but just to get it up to around 80 degrees uh, to, to help it germinate. Okay. That, I always start. Um, what month April are you doing 19th. this, Dave? Sorry? What did you say? April what? April 19th. April 19th. What, why yes. is that a magic day? Um, up until this year, uh, the mag it was a magic day because you didn't want the pumpkin plant to be too big in the pot before you you transplanted it into the uh, into this cold soil. Mm -hmm. But uh, this year, we even tried to start some hydroponically, which was very successful, mm -hmm. and uh, and those ones were started at the end of February. Oh wow! But as far as I know, nobody has blogged about starting them and growing them hydroponically. Mm. And uh, anyhow, we tried this just because uh, we're trying everything, trying to be scientific, see what would happen. And uh, I, the, the hydroponically started pumpkin uh, grew to be 1,339 pounds. Goodness. And so... It was substantial, no record or anything, but it was, uh, and it didn't die. Transplanting into soil mm -hmm. was fine. Okay. And you just got to know that these pumpkins are, are very hard to kill. They're a little bit like weeds and uh, they want to grow. So uh -huh. you okay. just do your thing and let them do it. Okay. So let's talk about location. So I'm to grow a gigantic pumpkin like this, when are you transplanting out? What, what is the soil temperature you're wanting? We, you've said we need a thousand square feet for all the foliage, but like how many daylight hours do we need? Should we put them on a platform when they get to a certain weight so that we can lift them on a pallet or something? Like what, how do we decide where it's going to go and when we should put it in the ground? Okay. So uh, as I said, the, the, the plant likes a thousand square feet. So my pumpkin patch is 2000 square feet wow. and I can grow two plants. And, um, and so from April 19th to May 5th, May 5th was the day that I placed them into the soil. But 
before doing that, as you mentioned, soil temperature. So we built a week before that, we built a cloche, mm -hmm. uh, just a temporary greenhouse that was uh, eight feet by 10 feet with a light bulb in it. Okay. We, we built that over the soil and, and allowed it, the sun to warm up the soil a little bit. Okay. But again, this year, uh, my, my motto is, is, is why do less when I can do more? <laughs> so I built a bigger cloche over the little cloche. It was 14 feet by 20 feet. Now that, that bit of, of insulation uh, really, really made a difference. So I've never done that before and I will do that from now on moving forward. Wow. So, so there, there's one other thing, soil temperature is probably more important in the early ages to, or, or the early stages, sorry, uh, of the pumpkin plant. And generally, we won't get soil temperature well into July. So, so now we're really able to force that plant to start growing because it's happy with mm -hmm. the soil temperature. Mm -hmm. Now, about one, what? What what temperature are we going for? Uh, anything over sixty is good, but I okay. had my soil up to seventy. Seventy, okay, which is yeah. very good. Mm -hmm. And on top of the double closures. Uh, we have soil heating cables. So uh, they're used in construction and cold weather where you take a wire and you wrap it around a pipe to prevent the pipe, uh, the water from freezing. So we will bury uh, uh, e enough of usually about 50 feet of this over a four feet by four foot uh, square, about six inches below the soil level and and turn that on as well so we've got the the soil being warmed by electricity and then then the uh, soil uh, aided by solar so uh, is that because heating. there's diurnal temperature variation and you're trying to keep it consistent 24 hours a day you know uh, in, in my mind you could you could have it much warmer but mm -hmm. you don't want it any colder and and in the beginning, like I said, soil temperature is more important than any other factor of sun. What it's got to have water, but uh, you know, it, no, no, nothing matters more than soil temperature. Okay. So we worked on that really hard for the first uh, two three weeks. Okay. Which continued on for its whole growth because yeah. once it was built, um, all we had to do was remove the small cloche, the eight by 10, it was still covered with the bigger cloche, the 14 by 20. And by that time, uh, the, the days were getting longer and there was a lot more solar mm. uh, energy coming in. Okay, and about what, what week or what, what month did you take the small cloche out? <laughs> you know what I'm gonna do? Uh, I'm sitting beside my PC and I've got to open my uh, spreadsheet, my spreadsheet, <laughs> because uh, let me just put this down for a sec. You didn't think I would be this nerdy about it, did you? <laughs> no. And, uh, so this is, this is okay. This is all right. I, I actually don't have a note on that. Okay. Was it before the heat dome though? Cause I, are you worried about, I was curious, like, what did you do during the heat dome? We had this like big heat wave this year. And are you ever worried about like burning the foliage or like suffocating your plant? What did you do for ventilation? Um, okay, so uh, yes, uh, th these plants grow to have leaves that are give or take uh, six inches, two feet across. So you have these huge leaves, which become quite tough when they mature but when they're in the eight nine ten twelve inch stage they're like tissue paper mm. and um and the sun burns them very very easily they literally crinkle up mm. and um, uh, this year we, we had a series of misters 
just mm. like those ones you might be in an, a, an outdoor restaurant patio kind of thing and the mm. spray comes on. Mm. And uh, a good friend of mine, the previous BC record holder, mm. Scott, he had a bunch and he lent them to me and and I tried them and they would seem to work, but I don't I didn't have enough. And mm. so there is a an agricultural fabric, a growing fabric called Reme, mm -hmm. and it cuts about 50% of the solar energy. So uh, I would just loosely drape, you know, 10 foot by 10 foot pieces of this. I have a whole roll of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it becomes 12, 12 by 500 feet or something like that. So yeah, it's very fairly inexpensive. And you just cut big chunks of it and put it on the growing tips where the, the leaves are the most uh, vulnerable and, and, uh, and delicate. Okay. Okay. So I, I have two questions. I'm going to ask them both so you can answer in whatever order you want. Uh, do you trim foliage that is beyond uh, the pumpkin that has set when, when fruit sets. And the other question is, what do you do for, uh, your compost? Okay. Uh, let's talk about the compost first, because okay. we definitely work very, very heavily, uh, and a lot to improve the soil. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so over the years, I would use turkey manure because I live very close to a turkey farm okay. and turkey manure is quite mild unlike chicken manure which is very strong so but not very much um how much uh, is not very much for a plant that needs a thousand square feet <laughs> like <laughs> a, oh um, maybe a a yard oh a okay. yard of turkey manure yes okay if actually a half a yard because the yard would go over the two thousand square feet for two plants. Okay, so you're not actually put, dumping it down and planting the plant right into that, you're spreading it over the entire area. Yeah, we just spread a very small amount over the whole area. One yard over the whole area wouldn't be, even be uh, uh, covering it by an inch. Okay. And so um, it, it, it's, it's really not to, add that much fertilizer but it's to improve the uh, uh the organic matter and just the tilth and texture of the soil okay but it, as i was saying just that when we got cut off there um i plant right now in next week i will plant a fall rye cover crop Mm. which uh, is about the only cover crop that will grow through our winter here. Mm -hmm. So it'll grow up to about two feet tall uh, in, in, into March. And in March, we will cultivate it into the soil. Mm. And some people would call it green manure. But so you're growing all this nice vegetation and it'd be as solid as... Uh, as a lawn that you won't be able to see any soil between the, the blades of ryegrass. So it is quite a, a massive amount of, of uh, vegetation that we cultivate into the soil. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing. And, and, and what I augment that is the compost from the uh, Vancouver city uh, mm -hmm. garbage dump they have a fantastic uh, uh, really efficient composting facility there mm -hmm. and um, they sell it very inexpensively so you can buy a yard of that for about eight dollars wow. uh, which is that's, very so cheap. Reasonable. that's a lot of compost yeah that's super cheap wow that's yes. great okay Okay, great. So then, so then about the pruning, I've, I've okay, read first. that that's a good idea that once you've got fruit set that anything that grows beyond the, the pumpkin, you would, you would trim, but are you saying you, you just let it go as much as it wants to take that whole thousand square feet and really yes. absorb all the light? Okay. Okay. A pump, a pumpkin plant will grow really fast and really in a wild fashion. Um, it sends out a main vine, 
from the seed area. And if you don't train it to go in one direction, it'll go in many, many directions. So what we do is train it to what we call a Christmas tree pattern and, mm. and we'll make it fairly straight. We use little roughly two foot long bamboo stakes mm -hmm. and we'll just guide the main vine uh, mm. towards the middle of the patch. Okay. And from the main vine, they're called secondary vines, we try to guide them at right angles, like branches of the Christmas tree, hmm. out, you know, to the side. So about every foot of the main vine, the secondary vines will sprout and shoot out. Uh -huh. So they'll alternate. So you get one right, one left, one right, one left. And so as I was saying, my, my, Pumpkin patch is 35 feet wide, 30 feet deep or long. And so it's roughly going down the middle, which is roughly 17 feet. And we'll allow that secondary vine to continue on and grow to the edge of the pumpkin plant mm. or pumpkin patch. Mm -hmm. And then we'll cut it off. It's called terminating. Mm -hmm. So then the next one will take a little while to grow there. And by the time the main vine is about 15 feet long, the first secondary will be right out to the edge. And the last secondary will only be about one or two feet long. And it forms a triangle like a Christmas tree. Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I can see it in my mind. I'm okay. trying to overlay it into my yard. And figure okay. It out. <laughs> okay. So from every secondary, you'll get another uh, bunch of vines or shoots called tertiaries. And we don't want tertiaries. Mm. Uh, from the tertiaries, you'll get the fourth set. And from that, you'll get the fifth set. And like I say, that's when it starts going wild. Mm -hmm. and, and you won't be very productive. Okay. In, 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 our, in our jargon, we say you're just growing lettuce. Just a whole bunch of green leaves, right? right. Okay. So, okay. so basically, with a few exceptions, you do not, uh, you prune off all tertiaries okay. and only grow the primary vine and the secondaries. Okay. Okay. Now, when the fruit is setting earlier in the season, like, uh, are you, like, are you, pruning the flowers and stuff too are you like really trying to focus everything on like one bloom that yes. you're like yep this is going to be my one and like pretty early yep. you're taking all the other ones away okay yeah so so there i if i'm not wrong there hasn't ever been a world uh, record holder that uh, was grown on a secondary vine you can grow a big one but not a record uh, mm. size pumpkin so you always want to try to pollinate the fruit on the primary vine. Okay. And you'd like to pollinate it when it's approximately 12 to 15 feet out from the seed. Okay. Or, or the stump it becomes quite a big bulbous thing. So we call it a stump and, uh, or farther, it can be farther mm -hmm. out, but a minimum of 12, 15 feet is quite good. Okay. And, okay. And so, if there were any, and they're all female flowers that start, there, there's male and female flowers, but you'd pick off all the female flowers from the secondary vines. Okay. And if there was a female fly flower on the primary vine at six feet, you would pick it off. It's, gotcha. it's there's just not enough uh, plant behind the pumpkin to produce a nice big or, you know, record size pumpkin. Okay. Okay. This is, this is gold, Dave. This is, this is good information. Well, this Thank is, you. This is all pretty standard, you know, pumpkin growing, giant pumpkin growing practice. But, you know, these things grow so fast that you would like to actually prune something every day. Now you don't have to spend all day on it, but you could, 
you spend maybe 15 or 30 minutes every day just making sure you're guiding the secondary and the primary vines with these little bamboo sticks. Mm. Um, if, if the plant is pretty big, I mean, you might need 50 or 60 sticks to do this, mm-hmm. but uh, it, it's very regimented. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there are a lot of blogs that'll tell you how to do this and even YouTube videos, but you're describing it in such a meticulous way that is really appealing. I'm like seeing oh, it in my mind. Yeah, this good, is really good. 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 Can, can you tell me about your irrigation regime? Uh, can I tell you a little oh, bit about yeah. what you need to do with these vines yes, as they're please. growing out? Yes. Okay, please. so a pumpkin plant and I don't know the real name for it or anything, but we'll send out extra roots from yes. every leaf junction on the vine, whether it's the primary vine or the secondary vine. And so uh, as you're guiding these along, a root will develop and grow downwards uh, into the soil and create another set of roots Mm -hmm. so if you had a thousand leaves you would have a thousand sets of roots Mm -hmm. and so that's the whole secret of uh of actually growing the large pumpkin and what they found oh probably only 10 years ago it could have been longer than that but as a general practice about 10 years ago they found that if you put enough soil on top of the vine and buried the vine, you would get a second set of roots coming off of it. So the second set of roots, it doesn't know if it's going up or down, will actually grow up, which is quite unusual for a root. Yeah. But you've covered it with all this soil, and I guess it doesn't know which direction it really wants to grow in. just wants to grow in soil. So when it runs out of soil, it can kind of sense this. It actually does a 180 and it turns back down into the soil. So now you've got two sets of roots per leaf. And if you had a thousand leaves, you'd have 2000 roots. And so uh, it, it, And just going back a little bit, people used to bury, always buried their vines, uh, but they didn't bury them as much. Now they're burying them a little bit deeper. And I started doing this about three or four years ago, and I'm pretty sure it's part of my success to have to double your, your set of roots. You can imagine if you had a tomato and you double the roots you just get bigger and more tomatoes. Well, this is why you plant your tomatoes. You you take your transplants and you, when you put them into the soil, you, you plant them on their side, right? So that plant them on their side or you can plant them much deeper. Yeah. And where the stem, just like the pumpkins, where the stem is in the soil, it'll put out more roots. Yeah. This makes so much sense. But the idea that it's at every leaf too, this is a game changer. It is. It is. Wow. Wow, thank you. So the other thing, while I'm thinking of it, because we're still talking about the vines and everything. So the main vine is where you want the, the pumpkin, you know, the chosen one to grow. And like about 12 to 15 feet out. Mm-hmm. And uh, some people do start terminating the main vine as it goes straight into the pumpkin. Um, I try to keep it, keep it growing. So you have to put a quite a sharp bend in it. We just hmm. call them S bends okay. because the vine can't grow through the pumpkin. You have to bend it out of the way of the potentially big pumpkin that's going to be, you know, right. at the end. Hmm. And for instance, my pumpkin was this big one was 67 inches wide. So <laughs> you would have to plan for this S bend to be at least going sideways at least four feet to keep right. it out of the way of the potential pumpkin. You always got to think ahead a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that makes so much sense. 
So we know that the, the, the plant before the pumpkin is probably the main contributor and the plant past the pumpkin is a secondary contributor of, of all overall weight. Okay. So uh, I was a little bit worried because my pumpkin <clears throat> set at about 14, 15 feet, which is good for a nice big pumpkin, but I would have liked to have been a little bit farther out. Hmm. So uh, you, you make do with what you have. Every year is different. Mm -hmm. And my main vine continued to grow past the pumpkin. And so uh, I actually measured it today because I've documented everything. So I had roughly 14, 15 feet of vine, main vine, before the pumpkin. And it turned out I had 35 feet of vine past the pumpkin. Ooh. So I'm thinking differently now i'm thinking that that 35 feet of uh, a vine post pumpkin if you want yeah. uh, was very significant yeah yeah wow. i mean it, it all becomes significant when you when you break records right everything is <laughs> important that's right. right that's right it's like we Every, have to watch the game replay right we're like exactly. okay where how exactly. did we succeed where could we be better yes exactly exactly <laughs> so um okay so 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 now we've taken care of all the vines and by this time uh, the thousand square feet of, of soil patch is is covered mm -hmm. and um and you're just feeding and, and i think the last question you're asking me is irrigation yes so irrigation is a, a whole science in itself and um Excuse me, I just take a drink of water. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so the best irrigation that most pumpkin growers have settled into is called drip irrigation. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's two kinds of drip hoses. One is a literal hose with a, a little hole called a drip called a dripper every foot of that hose. And the drip tape is just a little softer, it's flatter, but it also has uh, a little hole called a dripper every foot of that tape. So if you can imagine, I've got a thousand square feet. I started at one side and I go to the other side and then one foot from that, I lay another hose or drip tape. Okay. And uh, being, 30 feet deep, I've got 30 drip tapes. Okay. So that is a significant one, amount of uh, coverage. When you think about it, there's one dripper per square foot of yeah. soil. Mm -hmm. So there's a thousand little drippers uh, uh, feeding the soil. And that, that's significant because you're really watering the soil evenly. Mm hmm and okay. let's say you've got more water on the right side than the left side. Well, I'm sure the, the vines would feed the pumpkin differently and, and you would get maybe a really um, abnormal shape on the right side. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just sort of general science. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, a given that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, this pumpkin that I grew is very round very beautiful in shape and mm -hmm, i gotta think that the watering was uh significant to keep it that way and and every leaf picked up enough water every vine every root to feed the pumpkin quite evenly and so what is the amount that you like we use drip tape in our so how long do you have it on for every day and is it do you do it um throughout like at different times of day, how are you, how are you yes. irrigating? So uh, when, when, when the, the pumpkin plant is in sort of full bloom, has covered the patch, we, we have timers and my particular timer has, you know, how often, which is four, six hours, eight hours uh, intervals. 
So I set mine at four hour intervals for 10 minutes. So oh. every four hours, it gets 10 minutes of water dripping through the drip tape. Does that change depending on how hot it is that day? Like, would you, in the heat dome this summer, were you like, oh, I got to do something? Yeah. Yes and no. I might, you know, just the feeling, I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the end test for how wet the soil is, you, you can buy real fancy as moisture meters and everything. Uh, but I get a shovel and I dig a hole yeah. and I can see how much soil is wet or how wet it is just from feeling it yeah. and, and checking it. Okay. But if you, yeah, if, if, if it's during the dome, which is exceedingly warm, I might give it an extra, uh, you know, 10 minutes or something, not, not a heck of a lot, but I see. Four every four hours, ten minutes every four hours through a thousand drippers is two hundred gallons. Yeah. So the the plant is getting each plant is getting two hundred gallons per day per plant. Wow, wow! So, and like you got to think that like you have to be so consistent because if you're putting on fifty pounds in a day, then you wouldn't want to have. A, a couple days where it's like, oh, big growth spurt. And then your water tapers off. Like, so it exactly. sounds like you have to like, keep it super consistent for those 96 days. Well, you know, it's, it's like people, right? I mean, you're going to get dehydrated or you get <laughs> overhydrated right. uh, or whatever, you know, depending on how much you're going to drink. So, but keeping it even would be, I mean, it's a, it's a living thing, right? Keeping it even would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So there's probably no world record breakers where there's just a, a fellow with a hose for yeah, exactly. an hour a day. Kind of thing. Exactly. Okay. No, no, okay. nobody has ever grown a world record that way. <laughs> right. And yeah. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, so I have a set of, I, I have a, I have two taps in my main pumpkin patch for two plants and I have two different timers and two different sets of drip tape so that, uh, I can, if I wanted to, custom mm -hmm. the the watering or the feeding because now I use the drip tapes for feeding. Oh, okay. What and are you so, feeding? Yeah. So the 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 other aspect of the whole thing is is feeding the pumpkin. And uh, in the past, I've done a lot of foliar feeding, mm -hmm. and a lot of people do that. It's supposed to be good, but not as good as a drip feeding. Getting to the root. And I can say that just because I have a big pumpkin. But yeah, exactly. You, know, you can say that. One, one year doesn't make, uh, 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 you know, the, the champion forever. <laughs> so you, we have to try it again next year to see if it works. But <laughs> right. Is this fish, uh, fish, uh, fish emulsion or what's the food you're using? It, it could be. But just to go back one step, the, there was a, a record holder in, in, in England mm -hmm. who we went to visit uh, three or four years ago when we went on a holiday, and, and uh, he showed us a lot of things. They, they own a professional nursery, mm. a commercial nursery, so they understand watering and feeding and everything really well. And I decided to adopt his kind of method because there's many different methods and if you adopt too many different methods you're never going to get in my mind you know a real solid method of, of what you want to do well so, and also england seems like a climate comparable to where we are so probably if he can grow ooh. champion pumpkins in england then <laughs> you know. and, but they're nursery men and you, you've got to understand that they grow at 100 percent inside the greenhouse uh, right so they control it and, and gotcha. they are very, very, very successful nurserymen. So they have about 6,000 square feet of computer controlled uh, greenhouse for six 1,000 square foot patched. Wow. Uh, you know, for their six pumpkins. Wow. And um, it, it has shade cloth that is mm -hmm. computerized to come on and off. <laughs> when it gets too hot it has wow. 
automatic watering, uh, you know. Uh, it's a smart home for their pumpkins. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I, I'm telling this story because they usually are one, two, three, four, five in the world. They were zero this year. Oh. Disease got into their patch. Um, things blew up, melted, fried. Every uh, conceivable problem was uh, happened in their greenhouse, and, and they had nothing basically. Wow. So, Heartbreak. so details are important, even though they took care of their details. You can have a disastrous oh. year, or yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, about the food, that's yeah. kind of neat. Their their um, uh, uh, model was to not foliar feed, which I think is a bit revolutionary. So I didn't foliar feed at all. Uh, usually I'll foliar something every two or three days throughout the season. Mm -hmm. And uh, their their whole premise was not to get the leaves wet. They ah. felt that the leaves would stay healthier if they didn't get wet. Mm -hmm. So the only time they ever got wet was when I sprayed a fungicide on them. Mm -hmm. And that's about the only way you can apply a fungicide. Mm -hmm. And this year, aphids attack pumpkins uh, every year and, 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 and uh, viciously. And so we have to use an insecticide. but. I discovered that insecticides uh, can be delivered through the drip system. Uh, they're taken up by the roots and the water and everything gets into the leaves. And when they bite the leaves, uh, they die. <laughs> so. Okay. Because normally with aphids, of course, they, they, people say, oh, just uh, uh, hit them off with your hose. But you yeah, don't want to yeah. get your foliage wet, especially if, you know, most people are going to try to grow a pumpkin and it's probably going to be field grown. It's not going to be a record yes. breaker, but then you have powdery mildew issues. Yes. And so yes. you don't have that problem, I guess, in your greenhouse. Well, uh, yes. In fact, I have a really heavy problem of powdery mildew in my whole garden. Oh, you do? And, okay. Yes. And I don't know why. Some people have less, some people have more must be something in the soil or the surrounding area or whatever mm -hmm. the microclimate might be. So mm -hmm. um, for the pumpkins, there is no holds barred on the fungicide. And I applied seven applications of fungicide to control the powdery mildew, mm -hmm. which is pretty serious. That <laughs> is, that is. It's like one maybe or two, two or three times and, a season, and, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, so anyhow, uh, we, we, we have some leaves right now that are sort of as nice as they were in June. Hmm. So amazing. Uh, yeah, it is amazing, but you wouldn't want to eat the pumpkin. No, right. No, I, I thought that using any kind of chemical was like a little bit frowned upon in giant pumpkin uh, growing circles. No, there are no. They're rules. like, go for it. Okay. There's because no I, rules. Apparently Sorry. the Italian world record breaker, people are like, ah, oh, he probably pumped it full of chemicals. Um, yeah, it, and, and it just doesn't happen. Now, all of the fertilizers that most pumpkin growers use, I don't know, I don't know him very well. He's been growing pumpkins uh, well, and we have traveled in Italy and gone right past his town. So <laughs> it's... Uh, what can I say? Uh, the chemicals, maybe they're just referring to the uh, the the fungicides and the insecticides. Mm -hmm. But all the fertilizers that I use and a lot of pumpkin growers use are certified organic. Mm -hmm. So without the fungicide and the insecticide, um, my my patch would be organic. Right. And so, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, uh, potassium is a very important part of the the whole you know soil thing and we get it from potash which mm -hmm. numbers are 0050 but that's just dug out of the ground ground mm -hmm. up and applied as fertilizer mm -hmm. so it's not like your normal 
202020 that yeah. a lot of people might use. Gotcha. And uh, and uh, so yeah, so the, so so chemicals are could be one thing, but um, yeah, I don't know but what more that for means. like preventative stuff, not necessarily for big growth. It's more like yes, you're exactly. you're trying to prevent pest and disease, but exactly, um, but not not to actually grow the fruit. So, what would you say then for somebody like myself who's gonna just grow field? Like maybe I could get a little cloche in my front yard. I'm not gonna grow a record breaker, but you know, I have had some issues in the past. Maybe it's the it's the watering inconsistently where maybe there's some big growth and then it splits at the top of my pumpkin or, right, you know, right. that kind of thing. What, what would you say, like the most common issues that somebody who has a, a, you know, a backyard plot and is like, yeah, I could maybe do 30 square feet or something like that and devote it to my pumpkin. What, what are some of the troubleshooting tips you would say? Um, that so let, let me describe a, 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 a competition around the world that is in the within the same body of the pumpkin growing world here. And it's called the 150 square foot challenge. Okay. And, yeah. And uh, in April, you must submit a picture of 150 square feet that you have either used a board to board it off or a, a string and posts or something like that. Yeah. Take a picture, send it in with the dimensions and, uh, uh, to enter it is something like a two dollar fee, okay. and so this happens around the world with a lot of people like yourself who just don't uh, have a large plot. So yeah. the record for a hundred and fifty square feet is over a thousand pounds. <gasps> so yes! it is doable. That's amazing. Uh, yes. Oh my gosh! And uh, I've I've helped a friend grow. Uh, grow uh, a pumpkin out of a really like a half a, a oak barrel yeah a wine barrel yes. and it, it grew to about 200 pounds so uh, and all the soil it had was was the barrel it, what was in <gasps> that's like what I did this year so I just yeah. I basically we have rabbits so I put some of our fresh uh compost mix that we 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 bring in a couple yards to top dress every year. So I just mm -hmm. kind of mounded it up as big as I could like put my arms around it, just like, as you know, if I was like yep. making my arms big and then I mounted some of our um, rabbit poo on that. Yep. And then all I did was I opened up a wine box and took the, the bottom out of it and like yep. basically taped that and used that to like hold my mound together, just like yeah. a piece of cardboard. Yep. And so right. it was maybe, you know, 10 inches above the ground and just filled with compost and, and rabbit poo. And I grew it out of that. And, and without any consistent watering, basically once a week, I'd go and stand there for a few minutes with the hose. Uh, but it delights the neighbors and the kids. Yes. It's like in our yeah. driveway, people, honestly, we see them walk by and then walk back and take pictures. And like, we've actually thought maybe we should put a sign out that's like tag us on Instagram and like, yes, guess, guess the weight, yeah. that kind of yes. thing. And, you know, we're at 116 pounds without even really trying very hard. So exactly. I want to win the 150 square foot challenge. <laughs> I am going to put all the links in the show notes so people can get in on it with me. We can follow each other on Instagram. What do right. you do with the pumpkin when the season's over, Dave? Uh, just like your pumpkin, I carve it up and put it on the driveway. <laughs> That's, great. <laughs> That's great. How do you this, even begin to I'm carve not, it? This year, yeah, this year I'm not going to carve it just because it's so big. It's, it's very impressive just to stand beside it. Yeah. So uh, once you carve a pumpkin, as you know, the mold gets in and the they start softening and, and rotting pretty quickly. Yeah. So I'm not going to carve it. And uh, I think my wife came up with a great idea. Uh, we're going to make a giant Olympic gold medal <laughs> and just put that down there. And it's like number one, you know? Yes. Um, so we have right. to kind of design something that we're not going to cut into it. Mm. Um, last year, a lot of people saw what we did, but uh, 
the idea was uh, because of the COVID was so heavy and and uh, in last year we, we my my wife sold a giant mask with the same color blue <laughs> as the standard, and we cut a nose and the eyes out of it, and and that was it. <laughs> the, covered the bottom of the pumpkin with this giant blue mask. And, uh, That's great. I think it went over quite big that one. Though, so. I bet. How yeah. how how long does it take? Like a a thousand and something pound pumpkin to compost and break down. Do you like literally have to take an axe? Like um, how do you get it to break down? Uh, they they slowly rot into a pile of the stinkiest. <laughs> mush the grossest <laughs> gooeyest stinkiest mush you've ever witnessed <laughs> or smelled in your life which is so your neighbors love that season quite rotting pumpkin season. <laughs> well uh if we're lucky we catch the uh the big truck that comes along and, and empties our green bin uh-huh. and uh uh the the good guys that operate it they would just chop it up into great big chunks and they just throw it in the back oh and that's take so it great. away and and uh because everybody wants to help like oh, celebrate yeah, the pumpkin it, it's right it's and, like yeah you know yes yes and <laughs> do you save the, the seeds the beer doesn't hurt yeah <laughs> for sure <laughs> can you save the seeds yes we save the seeds uh from most good pumpkins and I, I grew three pumpkins this year, and two of them were from my previous personal best, which was thirteen hundred and seventy nine, wow. and um, and and they went on to be thirteen thirty nine and one thousand and thirty six uh, fifty six. Sorry, one thousand fifty six, wow. and it's it, it's and I, I I set out to try to do this, but within the pumpkin organization, if you grow three pumpkins over 4,000 pounds, and my, my three were 4,326, um, you get this beautiful sort of football bomber jacket Ooh. that they give you. It's called the grower's jacket, and, and not very many people have them. It's just, you know, one of the accolades that they give you. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's exciting. That's, and then and then your girl you can wear it when you guys go for a cruise. She can wear <laughs> your jacket. <laughs> just just to give you an idea of some more numbers it, it, it with this the big pumpkin the 1900 limb pump it's only 48 pounds shy of the canadian record hmm. and the, the the back east you get a lot more warmer weather like right now we have relatives in ontario and and nova scotia so you know they're they're getting 20 degree weather now and mm-hmm. and uh it, much better for growing pumpkins mm-hmm. and as you know today it was quite cold here mm-hmm. so the pumpkin would basically stop so they get an extra two three four weeks of better warmer weather than we do mm. so anyhow uh there there's another fellow in nova scotia he's the number one guy at about 1958 pounds or something like that Wow. And so mine is the second largest pumpkin in Canada, which is amazing, mind-boggling. Amazing, and you're making the west, the western part of Canada, proud with there this because you, you don't Bring hear it. a lot about it out here. Bring it out west. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so, so now, the, the, the sort of my last, most important thing that I did this year is to truly become scientific. I did a lot of soil tests or soil analysis. Yes. And you can take a soil sample. Uh, there is a large company, a fertilizer company that has a lab in Abbotsford. They're called TerraLink. Mm-hmm. And um, they will, will analyze. You need about a cup and a half of soil, not much. And you put it in a Ziploc bag and somehow you deliver it there, mail it to them. Mm-hmm. And they send you back. Uh, uh, an analysis that has 15 different parameters on it. So every uh, macronutrient like the NPK, Mm -hmm. uh, nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium, Mm -hmm. and then all the micronutrients 
which, uh, you know, are like iron or boron and manganese and all the stuff that most gardeners don't even think about. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if anybody wanted to get started, it would be a a wise idea to get a soil test. Mm -hmm. And then they would uh, add what they need to and not just pile on a bunch of rabbit poo. (laughs) <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. You it's see, you true. can, yeah, and, and, and there, there are a lot of people, which I consider myself one of them, were called morons <laughs> and moron growers put more on. <laughs> right? okay. And so you think, well, it's growing. Yeah. You know, just give it more fertilizer. Right. Um, I did s- seven soil analysis this year. And so when the pumpkin was growing, really well i did every two weeks so considering this pumpkin is only 98 days old (laughs) uh, every two weeks would give me an idea of what i needed and what was being used up Mm. and strangely enough i used the least amount of fertilizer i ever have for any other pumpkin i've grown Really? Okay. But see, yes, you've just proven that, that theory, right? I've, I've, we do soil testing here for our garden and the kind of, uh, guideline is like, I think I read this somewhere. It's like, really your soil is only as good as your worst deficiency. So you can keep throwing stuff on, but if you're deficient in this other area and you don't do anything about that, that's going to be your weak link. So I can see how actually it does save you quite a bit in the end if you keep throwing stuff at it but it's not actually yeah. effective then um yeah well that proves that theory well uh, yeah as i said one 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 win doesn't make a you know uh, <laughs> an expert i guess is what i'm trying to say but right. uh i've already contacted the fella in michigan who i've got to know now and he's got some more of the same seed that i use to grow this pumpkin okay and and so he's going to send me some seeds and I'm going to try to do the exact same thing basically off my spreadsheet. Yeah, and, scientific method. And I will I will uh, use some of the seeds from my current winter, the 1911. Okay. Yes. OK, so you can so, compare. Yeah, that will be the two two um, uh, the plants that I'll grow next year. Amazing. And his was the starter was the 2118, 2118 wow. pounds and Michigan state record. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, this is, I, I'm very keen to follow your progress and uh, <laughs> at this, this is exciting. So, so you, you've touched on this a little bit already, Dave, but I'd just love to hear your closing thoughts. How does growing gargantuan gourds help you cope with the weight of the world? Uh, You know, I'm a pretty happy guy. It makes me happier. (laughs) And nobody has ever left my backyard without a smile. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, and they say gardening is a very, very good mental, uh, you know, thing to do great for your you know disposition and everything and i'm a firm believer in that they we we garden every our whole our whole property is flowers or whatever my wife does all that Mm -hmm. and uh, we grow vegetables and of course these pumpkins but um yeah i mean makes you think as well i mean uh, doing a soil analysis you really have to study soil science to really understand Mm -hmm. that and and most days I try to watch a YouTube and learn something, whether it's about my other hobby as cars or or pumpkins or whatever. Mm. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing tool, YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I use it a lot and I've learned a lot of my pumpkin growing techniques from YouTube. So it sounds like you've also met a lot of like really cool, passionate people too. I, yeah, it, if you reach out, um, I've met and or talked to many world record holders. 
and they're all very interesting and all very helpful. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, for sure. You get to meet very interesting people, and they're from all walks of life, and uh, and sort of have the same interests as you have. But uh, we'll share seeds. If you, I've only bought one seed, and it actually was a dud; didn't grow anything. Uh, but uh, the rest of the seeds I've uh, procured just from chatting with people and and uh, the, the the side story on this pumpkin is really kind of neat because I went to my wife and I went to Las Vegas for the World Pumpkin Convention uh, just before COVID so two years ago mm -hmm. and I saw a friend who was standing with his friend and I walked up to say hi and this guy we chatted a little bit and he said hey would you like a couple of seats and I said, sure. I didn't know who he was or what the seeds were, but, you know, uh, and, and, and it turned out to be the, this record uh, pumpkin. Wow. And, uh, and so after we started email and chatting over the, the, the time after the convention, he told me that he was an emergency room worker in the New York General Hospital oh. and right in the middle where where they had thousands of people die. And he was working his, his butt off there. And, and uh, you know, it was just a, a very terrible time. Mm -hmm. And so as I was emailing, I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow your seed in honor of all the work you're doing in the hospital. And so there it is. We, uh, we got, a, we got a, uh, a real winner for him. And uh, so I was going to change the name of the pumpkin to karma just because it just all happened right yeah oh you're yeah. choking me up dave that's so sweet yeah yeah anyhow it was uh it, you know it just and, and we've been chatting on the on the email and he's a much much better and seasoned grower than i am and he's given me some tips and 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 so that's you know any hobby is like this you meet lots of nice people mm -hmm. he helped me do a couple of different things that I normally wouldn't do. And, uh, and the results kind of showed it, didn't it? You know? Wow. Well, Dave, thank you for being so open to this. I, I, you know, you got an email a few hours ago from me and now you've spent all this time. You've been so generous. You're, you've been an excellent mentor. I can't wait to make you proud next year. Uh, I'll definitely keep in touch and send you pictures, but I am going to get into that <laughs> 150 square foot challenge and uh, follow all your tips. I'll be re-listening to this again and again. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Dave. I appreciate all your wisdom. If I could give one more tip, it's uh, the World Pumpkin Organization is got all its information on uh, a site called Big Pumpkins, one word, bigpumpkins.com. Bigpumpkins.com. We'll put that Very in the simple. show notes and we'll put and, it. Uh, yeah. I have my diary. A lot of pumpkin growers will blog a diary on that. I have my diary on there and and uh, the whole sequence of events of growing this record pumpkin. Sweet. And, um, and tons of information on growing because they have a message board. You can find past history on 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 the record pumpkins everything is amazing on that site this is great i'm so excited i can't wait i like i said i'll put it in the show notes along with other things i'll also put uh pictures of your big wind day so people can see the pumpkin that we've been talking about um yeah thanks so much dave this has been fantastic you're welcome people don't talk a lot about this aspect of aging that sooner or later you're going to feel the urge to grow a giant pumpkin but i'll tell you i felt it creeping in feeling it at a bone deep level for a couple of years now and now that i've adopted dave as my personal trainer i'm gonna do it but here to weigh in on the topic <laughs> is a beloved friend of the show and my husband, Ruben Anderson. Welcome back to the show, Ruben. I am just <laughs> unspeakably delighted to be here, Carmen. <laughs> um, you know who else is unspeakably delighted? Are, are the listeners, particularly listeners who are women of a certain age, 
who have always enjoyed the Ruben Anderson experience and let me know about it. Whenever I'm like, sometimes I have my husband on, they're like, oh, I love the Rubenations. I'm like, yeah, I, <laughs> I know. They let me know. So uh, what came up for you as you were listening to my teacher, Dave, Ruben? Uh, well, I actually have some big questions arising out of this episode, uh, which aren't terribly pumpkin related. Uh, but before that, I wish, if there's one thing that I could wish for this episode, it's that the rubination would actually go before the airing of the episode, because I want to draw your listeners attention to your uh, vocalizations throughout this entire recording. So I first noticed it when uh, Dave describes the rooting, how you root the secondary branches and you like it er erotic is the only way to describe it, really. The way you gasped in delight uh, is uh, it's it's quite noticeable. And then uh, when he started talking about soil testing, you were like, yes. So uh, I yeah. Listeners are now going to have to go back and listen to the whole thing again, just to, uh, or maybe you could just offer a um, uh, a secondary download of just your audio track, uh, so that people could just appreciate all. They of could that. play it whenever they're doing their own household chores, for uh -huh. instance. I could be like, yeah. oh, <gasps> yes, <laughs> yeah. I think um, I think that'd be very popular. Mm -hmm. What else came up for you? Um. Well, there's the big question, which I'm going to save to the end. Um, but something that I, I noticed um, is that Dave talked about his wife uh, as in, in a sort of ambiguous way, I would say. And it made me immediately suspicious that actually Dave's wife is the champion pumpkin grower and he's sort of just the public front man. Why would you suspect that? isn't there always a uh, well, strong, powerful woman behind every great man? Yeah, I understand the, the logic, <laughs> but what was the tell? Well, that he would just be like, my wife does... Or... <laughs> <laughs> like, his wife was clearly a major part of this operation. Well, I'll tell you, I also followed up in writing with some more questions for Dave. So, for <laughs> instance, one of them, he, you know, he answered nearly every question I gave him except for one, which was mm -hmm. how much does it cost uh -huh, yeah. to grow a record-breaking pumpkin? And yeah. he said, uh, only his wife knows. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Though he did offer that um, the range is zero to $10,000. Uh -huh, yes. Yeah, I feel fairly confident. Me. He's, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's on the upper end. Um yeah, mm -hmm. I, it, it makes sense to me that this is, it takes a team, man. It takes, it takes teamwork to make the dream work. So uh -huh. it makes sense to me that, yeah, there's probably a, a, a silent partner involved here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, so I have two, two kind of big questions that I don't know which one to ask Are first, you saying then. this specifically big questions because it's the giant pumpkin episode? Or are they actually <laughs> really big? Are you no. dropping little no, puns I, here? I, no, I'm not saying that. Um, no, I mean, I mean, uh, the existential questions of life is what I mean. Like they're the mm. they're the big, you know, the big questions mm -hmm. of why are we here? What is the meaning of life and pumpkins? How do you grow a giant pumpkin? Yeah, mm -hmm. I have been hoping that at some point we could turn up the reverb so I could say massive pumpkins. Which, I'll try in post-production to do yeah, that. See if you can crank that in there. <laughs> um, I, yeah. So I, I guess I'll, I'll start with the, um, why are you so intoxicated by growing giant pumpkins, Carmen? Well, thank you for asking, Ruben. I didn't expect this. Uh, why am I? I, this is, I honestly do just think this must be a thing that just happens when you get older. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm older what? than you and it's not I, happened to me. I don't. Well, then people who feel it know what I mean. It makes me want to grit my teeth. I'm so excited about it. I just, they're so big. And okay, I'll tell you what. So we have our pumpkin that we grew mm -hmm. this year, which actually isn't even as big in like mass as the one that I grew last year, mm. but it's more noticeable because it's a white pumpkin. Last mm. year, I only got to giant green stage, but but it's a giant kind of creamy white pumpkin. 
And you know how it is. You have your tomatoes in the front yard. And so people all summer are walking by going, wow, look at this yard. And because our front window is like right there, we can like look out at people looking at our garden. Mm -hmm. And I love the families and the people just walking by who will stop in their tracks and go, look at that pumpkin. And then like sometimes they walk past it and then they walk back to it and then they're taking pictures. And I... Like, it really does just make me happy. Like, when Dave was like, Mm -hmm. it just makes me happy. I was like, I totally know the feeling, man. Well, and Dave did say that um, no one leaves his yard without a smile on their face. Yeah. Which which is a definitely a um, a gift to the world. It's a, you know, that is an expansion of goodness in the world. I'm just curious in terms of, like, if you're going to grow giant things, you could grow... Uh, how many pounds of potatoes could I get from 100 square, 150 square feet? How many pounds of tomatoes? Like there's, there's but the um... enchantment, the enchantment of the gigantic. Uh-huh. There's something about large, charismatic animals. Let's say, yeah, you know, yeah. we love bears, we love gi- gigantic sequoias, we like big things as humans. I think mm-hmm. maybe what we like is the feeling of being small. I'm so small. Could I live in that pumpkin? Like, mm-hmm. there's just a, I don't know. There's like the this the this kind of fantasy aspect to it. And maybe it harkens back to the dinosaur days, right? Of like, mm-hmm. I'm small and things are so big and um, being different scales, experiencing different scales of things is just really wonderful. And, mm-hmm. and it inspires wonder. And I mean, from a polyvagal perspective, right? Awe, anytime we experience something that's novel and outside of our normal experience, like we, we feel more awe at the sight of, say, a buffalo than a cow. There's mm-hmm. something about familiarity and novelty, and that activates the vagus nerve that enfolds us into a larger collective, right? I'm so small, the universe is so big. I'm experiencing wonder in this novel experience is enfolding me in a pro-social way into the collective. So, I, I mean, I think it's it's good for my vagus nerve. I want to grow giant <laughs> pumpkins. Oh, oh, I just want it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so you're making some compelling points um, that it isn't just useless busy work, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and and I think that there, there is, uh, you know, so I think part of this argument is that do you think uh, you want to grow giant pumpkins because capitalism has taught you that bigger is better, um, but you're actually making a, you know, in many ways a anti-capitalist argument that things don't have to be useful in order to be worth doing so let's uh, perhaps we can agree that uh growing a giant pumpkin is 99 percent useless uh with the exception but of the- be it resolved <laughs> that growing a giant pumpkin is useful for the greater good it's it's uh it's highly productive for the smiles of children that's um, right which is not a bad thing but yeah, but there is the aspect that it's like, you know, the as Brown Garden McDonough would, McDonough would say, you know, the cherry tree uh, makes tens of thousands of blossoms that just fall on the ground. Like there's nothing productive about it. Mm-hmm. It's just beautiful. Mm-hmm. And that's reason enough for its existence. Um, the cherry tree, of course, does not have $10,000 worth of soil testing, irrigation, cloches, uh, fertilizer, etc. So... I'm going to try to reel that in. But maybe what I'll do is I'll just shift some of my um, flower varieties of seeds Uh and shift that into pumpkin um, soil analysis and Uh compost and stuff. I'm just going to like shift some of the budget over here. (laughs) What's that? What's that um, process where small things make you violent? Like you just like love small things so much you want to squish them. I love you. It's good. You want to squish you so much. <laughs> There's like a process for that. And I have that with giant pumpkins. <laughs> like so The exact opposite of that. <laughs> well, it's like I just, it scrunches me up. I just want to do it. And I'm so excited by them. And it's, I, I just, I, so I once read um, a haiku uh, that was, uh, from the perspective of a dog and it's Mm -hmm. like dig under fence why 
because it's there, because it's there, because it's there. I think that matches the haiku. And that's like me with, you know, grow giant pumpkin. Why? Because it's there. Because it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, um, maybe you can start, like, I guess I have a hard time imagining you getting up at 630 in the morning to open up the cloche over your giant pumpkin. So maybe there's like another, maybe you can start another competition category of like wild pumpkins or something. <laughs> wild and free. Yeah. I'm yeah. super excited. I think the, the 150 square foot uh, thing is, is actually awesome. And as you know, I wish that we had the phone book Olympics. I think that it's ridiculous that uh, the tour de France um, racers don't all ride on the same exact same bicycle. You know, can you explain like, the phone book Olympics for people who don't sit around our dinner table and don't. know that? I mean, they, it's, it is what it sounds like, but just should they not just come sit around our dinner table? They um, should. So the phone book Olympics, the, I think the Olympics is stupid because of course, you know, if you train any, if you train anybody for, for 16 years, you're going to get substantially good at something. Um, but if you, I think the Olympics should be that you just open the phone book. You have a literal giant phone book of everyone in your in your country. You open it up, and it's like shot put. Open the phone book at random and stab your finger at a name, and that person is doing the shot put. And then it's like, <laughs> you know, four by one hundred relay. Open the phone mm -hmm. book, stab your finger at four names in the phone book. Mm -hmm. You know, so you just pick people at random from your country. And that would actually give you a much better sense of how generally physically fit and capable your country is. Yeah. Um, and also, I think, would have more exhilarating highs and terrifying lows. <laughs> <Absolutely. laughs> when some little Absolutely. string bean shows up for the shot put, you know, or yeah. like, you know. Well, and so, yes, the 150 square foot. Th I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm <laughs> yeah, so it's, excited about it's it. stock car racing of giant pumpkin growing, which exactly. I think is awesome. It's going to be in the front yard where we have done it, but I'm going to like do better with um, spreading out the compost. I, you know, when I think back to all the mistakes I made, <laughs> all the mistakes I made, there's also a category uh, rookie of the year. You can uh -huh. win rookie of the year. And mm -hmm. I can't help but notice that all I see are uh, small and older uh men people uh -huh. winning it small children and older men <laughs> and i'm like i want to be rookie of the year so um how many anyway. years do you get to practice to be a rookie that's my question like <laughs> what do we mean here so i anyway i'm gonna um i'm going for it well mm. thanks so much for your thoughts ruben any anything in summation uh no, I think we covered it over. I like that we managed to um, wonder if this is, in fact, capitalism at the root of it, uh, even in the giant pumpkin episode. <laughs> uh, and, of course, we get to dwell on the joys of the smile of a small child. That's true. And thank you for supporting my my passion. <laughs> Your wild dreams <laughs> <That's right. laughs> of giant gourds. <laughs> yes. Well, and to get inspired to see pictures of Dave's giant pumpkin, because I know you're dying to see it. This is like so frustrating. I mean, we're radio. It's theater of the mind. But really, you <laughs> want to see the giant pumpkin um, and including how they got it winched up and on and like traveling through the air onto the truck. Uh, you can go to giantpumpkinsbc.com. And special thanks to them for hooking me up and making the introduction to Dave, by the way. I, I do want to just share a small thing. Dave did the most terrifying thing that any like boomer aged person can do to every generation that comes after them. Um, and that is, uh, he responded to my email with call me and a phone number. I was like, I go, what? I go, like basically like shriveled. This is the passion and conviction that I'm bringing to this endeavor, my friends. I picked up the phone and made a phone call for like the first time in a decade. Anyway, I also put links to the Great Pumpkin Commonwealth, where you can check out the Letterman jackets, and also bigpumpkins.com, so you can track Dave and, and other avid growers' progress and glean tons and tons of pumpkin growing guidance. Uh, you can find all those show notes uh, with all the links in one place at numinouspodcast.com. Um, okay. Are, are all those links, do any of those links have pictures of Dave's wife who 
as uh, we now may know, is actually the mastermind behind this whole operation? I, you know, I don't think I saw very many woman people mm. in those photos. Mm. We've got to change that. Um, <laughs> yes, you should uh, definitely fight for equality of the giant pumpkin field. <laughs> It's it's probably I actually have seen uh, couples with their matching jackets on um, uh -huh. who who enter as a team, which I think is is only fair. Yeah. Okay, so listener shout out for folks following along on Instagram. Occasionally, I post about who is not listening to the show, specifically in America. I recently shared that every state in America regular sh regularly showers this show with downloads and love, with no one notable uh, holdout, which is North Dakota. But recently, <laughs> two wonderful individuals in North Dakota have listened to the show, and I just think that's super sweet. I wish there you guys should just be pals. Anyway, <laughs> we're friends now. Say hi on Instagram and let me know who you are. Uh, you can follow me there, or you can go to my website and learn more about how to access like all of my offerings for one low, low monthly membership. So the Numinous Network is where I'm cross-pollinating all my work in the areas of attachment, polyvagal theory, somatics, mysticism, everything else. So you get all my courses, plus like 15 to 20 live calls a month. So all my workshops, they're all bundled together in as one price. And um, just uh, for clarity. Giant pumpkins are free. <laughs> this this content about giant pumpkins, which is actually quite, I think, riveting, is for free. This is my public service. Um, I just want to also clarify, no, you can't just sign up for one workshop separately because it's a bundle. Like it's a bundle for one price. I don't actually understand why you would even want to do that. It's So put it this way, the monthly price is less than half my hourly rate. It's less than what a workshop would cost. So you get the workshop plus all of these other things in a bundle. Anyway, so here's the upcoming workshops. October 31st, which is New Year, Halloween, Samhain. We're making witches ladders, super fun. November 21st, 10 steps to trauma-sensitive trance work. December 31st through January 1st, it's Yuletide Folk Fest which was formerly known as the Yuletide Stocking Stepper. So it's 12 days of ritual observances, beginning with a winter solstice workshop to herald the season. So all these things are included, plus the other like 15 live calls a month. Anyway, you'll find all the details at carmenspaniola.com. C-A-R-M-E-N-S-P-A-G-N-O-L-A. Until next time, take care. Uh, Carmen, Carmen, I have a question. What, what? Is uh, for the witch's ladders... Yeah. Are you going to be teaching uh, anything about knots? <laughs> okay, this is a plant. This is what they call <laughs> in the show. He's planted this. So I was actually going to just share my screen. Since you're not going to be there, Ruben, I'm going to share the animated knots.com uh, little video of how to do the constrictor knot, which is the best knot for witches' ladders, approved by Ruben Anderson. <laughs> Well, I'm relieved to hear that uh, this workshop will have suitable not content. It would be negligent not to include it. Not. Not to, to include it. <laughs> okay. Till next time. Take care. <laughs>